would like to say good morning. <laughs> and I'm actually very impressed that so many people are here because my son, who's 10, also kept me up till 2.45 because he refused to leave where everybody was making films. I was like, go to sleep. <laughs> it's amazing. So thank you. Now I'm getting a taste of what it's like to be intense. I, you know, I, I had a lot of thoughts coming through my head, and then I sat down for the last one. And it was like, whoa, ethics and leadership. And actually, it confused me. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try and start with what I was thinking, and then would also love to answer it with questions. For me, though, I'd like to begin with what I consider to be my hero in human rights and someone who inspired me to do the work that I do. And that is a four-year-old boy. I usually end with him, but I'm going to start with him. Because at the end of the day, he is the one who I think of all the time in terms of who we are and what we can do. So I used to work in Cambodia. And I worked in prisons there. My goal was, as it is now, to end torture as an investigative tool by placing lawyers at an early stage in police stations and courtrooms. But the person who always inspired me was Vishna. And Vishna was this four-year-old boy who was born in the prison because his mother had committed a crime. Now, usually, you know, you're not allowed in and out of prisons, and you're not allowed in and out of prison cells. However, because Vishna was born in the prison, the guards loved him. <laughs> He's very cute from the time he was a baby. And so they always allowed him to slip in and out of the bars. But you know, he was growing bigger and older. And by the time that I met Vishada, he was already four years old. And so you know what gets bigger as you grow? He would always slip through the bars, but his head was getting big. So by the time I met him, he would come up to the bars, and there would be like the first bar, the second bar, the third bar. And he would climb up to the first one, the second one, and the third one, because by then he knew precisely what had the biggest openings and the biggest cracks. And then he would turn his body and slip through and then turn his head and just barely make it through and then go down three, two, one and come and grab my pinky. And the reason he grabbed my pinky is because he wanted to go visit all 156 prisoners in the Cambodian jail in Kandal province. And so sometimes I would lift him up and he would put his fingers through and sometimes it was like for the prisoners who were in dark cells, he would, uh, there was like a little place in the dirt where he would just slip his fingers through and then they would just hold on to them. Now, many of the prisoners told me that he was their greatest joy and that he was the person that they so looked forward to. What I found really amazing and inspiring about Vishna is that you know he was this kid who was born into a prison without any material goods, with what people would say is no power and nothing. And yet he, like all of us, had a sense of his own heroic journey, that he maybe he couldn't do everything but he could do something. And so he would do the one thing that he could do. And I believe that's true for all of us in leadership and in our own heroic journeys. I believe that all of us from the time of birth, you know, it's a pretty, I don't know, you know, it's kind of a bloody process. It's not actually easy. But when you come out, you're born into your heroic journey. And each of us is born with different gifts. They're not the same. And there may be so many different ways that we can give our love and be of service to the world. And it is for us to know that we can always do the one thing that we can do in whatever the situation is, and as we connect it to our greater passion and our greater purpose. Today, I'd like to share with you part of my own human rights journey, but also the journey of very courageous defenders throughout the world who are working in this one area of ending torture as an investigative tool. I started my own journey really not as someone, and I, I will say, you, you probably didn't see me, but I just was downing some coffee, and I was worried that I wouldn't get it into my system before coming up here. And, and the reason I do that, people tell me it's my crutch, that I don't really need coffee. Um, but I am one of these people who never, I, I was, you know, there are people who are always speaking up in class, right, who are like, okay, I'm going to speak, I'm going to speak, I'm going to speak. I was all my life from the time of grade school to high school, even in college, and then in law school, 
and then in divinity school, everywhere, I would have to sit in class. And even if it was a small group, I'd say every single time, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. Because I knew I was supposed to speak. I was supposed to take part in conversations. But I was so absolutely painfully shy that it was really, really hard for me. So I was never one of these people who actually wanted to speak up, um, which is why I was downing some coffee. But what I have realized in the course of my own journey is that when you give yourself into the service of something greater than yourself, something transforms and something happens for you. So for myself, I didn't actually start out thinking that I wanted to be a quote unquote leader in human rights. But what happened is that I recognized that there was a gap and there was a need. And this also came from my experiences in Cambodia of one day in 1994, walking into a Cambodian jail and meeting a 12-year-old boy who had been tortured and did not have counsel for stealing a bicycle. And what I realized at that point was that for the hundreds of letters that myself and other people wrote to Amnesty International, to Human Rights Watch, for political prisoners who had done something good for somebody, that neither myself nor any of my friends or colleagues would ever write a letter for this 12-year-old boy because he was not an important political prisoner who had done something for anybody. He was a 12-year-old boy who had stolen a bicycle. Now, the irony of the situation, and I think this is, this is also you know, one of the things about leadership, is that you can be whoever you are. You don't have to be necessarily the most talented person, although I realize everybody here is talented. But it's that you recognize the time in history where the opportunity is there for us to do something and for us to come together as a world movement. So what I recognized at that point when I met that 12-year-old boy who had been tortured and beaten by the police was that I, and the fact that I wouldn't write him a letter because he was not a political prisoner and he was not anyone important who had done anything for anyone. What I recognize is that the Cambodian government like 92 other governments in the world, had already passed laws. And the laws said on the books, you have a right to a lawyer, and you have a right not to be tortured. But there was no legal system to protect him. And, and this is what I see. I mean, Mr. Kemka Shiva said a number of times, you know, it's about ethics, about spirituality, it's about leadership, but then it's about doing something, right? You actually have to implement. You have to actually make it happen. You can't just go, oh, you know, this is great. So the laws are there. Out of the 113 countries that torture today, 93 of these countries have all passed laws that say you have a right to a lawyer, you have a right not to be tortured. The issue is implementation. And the issue even greater than that, and I think this is where we, as each individual person, world citizen who lives in this world, has to decide, is that we as a world community have not decided that we want to end torture as an investigative tool. Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a Buddhist monk, once said, was once asked, what do we need to do to save this world? And he stopped and he thought about it. And I think some people in the audience were waiting for a very great strategic plan. How are we going to save the world? What are the bullet points? But he saw, thought and he stopped and he thought about it. And he said, the only thing that we need to do to save this world is to allow ourselves to hear the cries of the world. And this has been a big part of my journey as well, is to allow myself and to work with people to allow us to hear the cries of the world in this one particular area. What I understand is that today, it is the poorest of the poor who are tortured. When I was in college, I read a book. And the book said, it was called, The Rich Get Richer and the Poor Get Jail. And I thought, oh, that's terrible. And I grew up and I became a public defender. But what I realized today in working in so many countries in the world, and International Bridges of Justice has justice makers and fellows in over 30 countries in the world. What I realize today is that the rich get richer, maybe, but the poor don't only get jail, the poor get tortured. 
And that is true in many, many countries. And, and in India, where we are today, five people will die today. Because every, people, every day, five people die in police custody. And it is not because, you know, it's, it's, it's like the dreams are unrealized. Because in these 93 countries, people have, have you know, I remember when I was in college, I guess 25, 28, something like that, years ago, we were, we were, we were saying, oh, okay, we, you know, we have to fight for democracy. We want to fight against dictatorships. There's dictatorships everywhere against closed communist systems, against authoritarian, or we're going to fight these things. And the irony of it is that today, um, many of those battles have been won, but they actually haven't been won for the poorest of the poor in most countries. People still walk, away, walk around with not freedom from fear, but in fear. In fear because if you are you know, middle class or upper class, you're going to be OK. You'll be picked up by the police, and your life will be safe. But if you are not, you will not be protected. You will be picked up, and you will be tortured in almost 95% of the cases. And it's not, like I said, it's not. Um, 10 minutes is over. OK, so it, it's not in one country. It's, it's, it's across the board. But what I want to really emphasize is that it, there's an incredible window of opportunity for us right now in our lifetime to end it. I, I see everything that's there. I believe very strongly that one of the most critical things is what is possible in the now. Prevention of torture before someone is actually the prevention of torture in terms of the timeline is absolutely preventable if we decide as a world community to do it. But we have to decide. And I hope that you will join the defenders in this journey, because they are isolated. And they are phenomenally courageous in their leadership of not being the most popular people in the world, but saying, you know, we can do this, and we can do this together. So I think I have two minutes for questions. So I think it's phenomenal, the work that you do, and I want to thank you for doing it. Uh, I wanted to raise an ethical dimension of this, which is um, for, for a long time I've taught about the torture convention and the abhorrence that is torture, and yet I watched the, the movie uh, Zero Dark Thirty, and I think in some ways you were positioned in that movie to sort of think, well, in certain circumstances. And I'm wondering how you deal with those ethical dimensions of when it involves issues of national security. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying I, I think this, but I think you could easily show the film to students and they would be like, OK, absolutely, yeah, you need to torture those people. I wonder how uh, your defense has addressed that issue. Again, it's always framed as national security even when it's not. But what about cases when it might be? You know, Thank you so much. Yes, I, I would actually would love to have a longer conversation with you about that, because I think it is a longer conversation. But I also want to say that I, I feel that the larger issues of, but you might have that one case of someone who you need to torture to get information, actually detracts us from the fact that five people are being tortured to death today in this country. Hundreds of people will be tortured as an investigative tool, that, that there's a slippery slope, that our sort of looking at the big question of can we allow torture sometimes stops us from saying, no, but what can we do right now to stop the people who are being tortured, who are not the terrorists, who are not whatever, but just happen to be you know, poor people who do not have, have counsel. So I think, I think yes, there's, there's an issue, and you, know, you can layer it, and logically we can discuss it. You know, can you? Maybe. You know, maybe. But I think the larger issue is, can we still work as a world community to support the poorest of the poor who continue to be tortured every single day, who are not in that category? Thanks. Karen, just a question. Uh, you know, it's obviously a, a wonderful work that you're doing. But how can one get involved? How, what can one do to help? You said the other day that we should roar and that we should take risks, and we should say what we should say, right? So I will say this. How can we get involved? I'll be very blunt about it, and I'm not supposed to say this anywhere, but you cannot do it without money. 
You cannot do it without resources. In every country that we work in, there are defenders who, who have the prophetic imagination to do it and are going into the cells. And they're saving people's lives every day. But it's not prioritized on the world agenda. And so a couple things. Number one, if you have money, I think you should give some to the cause. Number two, if you don't have money, you can help spread the message of awareness of us coming together as a community to also put together the financial resources so that people can do the work that they need to do to, to do the necessary building blocks. It's, it, you know, it, it, it takes resources, it takes commitment, but people can't keep working in this area without being able to support themselves on a, on a daily basis. Thank you, Reverend Shea. We now have a token of appreciation from Tegel.